What's the story, morning and glory? What's the word, hummingbird? Thank you so much for clicking on my channel and for joining me for this review of Married at First Sight, Season 17, Episode 8, Divorce Prayers and Spider Scares. Let's get started with Brennan and Emily. So all the couples are back in Denver. They're all supposed to be moving in together and to start this so-called real life as a married couple. So Bren Brennan and Emily arrive in their new apartment and automatically you can tell that Brennan is a little bit off. There's something about him that that's just not all together present. Emily is still her bubbly self. You know, she's still talkative and engaging and very present. Whereas Brennan seems a little bit distracted. He's not talking very much with her. He's not interacting very much with her. So you can tell that there's something that's kind of off. So Brennan suggests that they don't move in together right away, that they still live in their individual apartments. And then at some point, um, I guess after they've talked about it, I don't know exactly what would be the deciding factor. They will move in together in this shared apartment. And, um, Brennan tells us that he needs his space because he's been together with Emily every single day for the past seven days, um, while they were on their honeymoon. And so he needs his space and it's kind of like, this is not off to a good start at all. This is like a huge red flag because you're supposed to be excited about this person and moving in together and starting this life together. But he says that he doesn't want to move in right away and he needs a space. So the next day, Emily goes to Brennan's apartment. And as you know, she's checking out his apartment, he's giving her the tour. He's still very distracted. He's very distant with her. He's still not very talkative. He's giving these one word responses and um, she can sense the tension. She can sense. So there's something about him that's kind of off. And then Brennan says in his confessional that it's been really nice having time to himself. Also very concerning, very worrisome because you just got married and you're supposed to be excited about moving in with your new wife. So Brennan comes over for the Pastor Cal meeting. Pastor Cal is going to be meeting with them. And so they both decide, you know, to come back to the apartment for the meeting. And in the beginning, before Pastor Cal arrives, once again, Brennan is still kind of acting a little bit off, very iffy. His whole demeanor is just, you know, like, like he's just... Something is bothering him, obviously. So Pastor Cal arrives and Brennan does admit that something is off and that he stopped feeling a romantic connection with Emily at some point. Um, he doesn't know why the attraction stopped. He does. He probably doesn't want to say it. He knows exactly when it stopped, um, if it even was there to begin with. He knows. So Brennan says that he wants to feel the kind of feelings that he's supposed to feel as a new husband. You know, he wants to be connected to her. He wants to be like, you know, wanting that need to be physically close to her, to touch her. And so then Pastor Cal is like, so you're basically saying you don't want to touch her. And Brandon was like, well, when you put it like that, you know, that's a really effed up way of putting it. But you know, the bottom line is, yeah, he's not feeling that physical attraction towards her. So he, uh, Pastor Cal was like, well, are you even trying to get that physical connection with her? And Brennan says that he was trying throughout the whole entire honeymoon. He was trying, but it just really, the feelings were not there. Pastor Cal says that this is a different type of situation. And so the romantic feelings and the intimate feelings are going to come about a little bit differently than they would, you know, in the real world, which I kind of disagree with Pastor Cal. I think that if the feelings are there, the feelings are there, regardless of what kind of situation that you're put in. Um, if that attraction is there, it's there. Let's not forget about one of the most successful couples that came from Married at First Sight, Woody and Amani, um, the New Orleans, I think it was this, the, was it New Orleans? The New Orleans season, I think it was. Woody and Amani had that instant connection. They were drawn to each other. Woody could not keep, keep his hands off of Amani. He could not keep his eyes off of Amani. And yes, it was the same exact situation, but their romance blossomed and they got it on and popping. I think it was on their honeymoon that consummated their marriage. So Pastor Cal, I really don't buy what you're saying when you say, well, this is a different type of environment and things. No, if the, no matter what environment that you're in, if two people are drawn to each other, they're going to be drawn to each other. So 
Pastor Cal says, is there anything about her that you are not attracted to? And Brandon says, I'm not going there. I'm not going to go there with you. Um, as if he's doing some type of heroic thing by not saying that. But there's a reason why Pastor Cal is asking that, you know, we need to know what it is because if it's just a physical thing, okay, then maybe, I don't know, maybe it's doomed. May if it's the way she's acting or the things that she does or the things that she says, maybe these are things that can be worked on. So he's asking for a reason. He's not asking for you to dog her out. He wants to know exactly what is not connecting with you with this woman. And so then he asks her the things about her that he does like, what do you like about Emily? And he lists a whole bunch of things, a plethora of things of what, what he liked about her, what he was drawn to about her, like her personality. She's outgoing. She's spontaneous. She's down for whatever. She's really fun. She's, you know, um, you know, a bottle of energy. She's all these wonderful things, but he's just doesn't feel, basically the bottom line is y'all. He just doesn't feel a physical attraction. He understands that she's a great woman, that she's a great catch, but just not a great catch for him. I think it's just, it comes down to looks. I think he's not physically attracted to her. He doesn't want to say it because it's going to do something to her ego. He thinks it's going to do something to her ego. And I don't know why it's, it's, I understand that her feelings could be hurt. You know, it could be hurt by that, but everybody's not going to be attracted to everybody. You know what I mean? I don't think there's anything wrong with saying I don't normally date blondes or, or yes, I, she's a beautiful woman, but I'm just not physically attracted to her. I don't think there's anything wrong with saying that. It doesn't mean that she's not attractive. It just means that you are not drawn to her. You know, you are, are not um, attracted to her. It doesn't mean that there's something wrong with Emily, that she's not an attractive woman. And I think that, you know, for him to not really want to participate in this meeting with Pastor Cal, and what I mean by that, for him not wanting to be honest and open and transparent about exactly how he's feeling, it shows that I don't think he really cares if this marriage works or not. I don't think he it, it, it's he's really invested in this turning into a successful marriage. So after Pastor Cal leaves, Emily asks him, um, she needs to know if he's physically attracted to her. She's like, just tell me whether or not you're physically attracted to me because you were evading the question with Pastor Cal, but I need you to tell me once and for all, are you physically attracted to me? And he refused to do it. He said that um, it wasn't nice. It wasn't a nice thing for him to do. He said that he was just trying to protect her. Um, he was saying that I wouldn't want anybody to tell me that. So all these things that he was saying as far as why he won't give her an answer was basically giving her an answer. And the answer is he just was not physically attracted to her. And I don't know why um, he was he he said what he said because you're he basically he was admitting that he wasn't physically attracted to her by saying I don't want to tell you because I'm trying to protect you like that's even worse than saying Emily I'm not physically attracted to you I think for him to say I don't want to tell you because then you're leaving the door open for her to speculate on a whole bunch of things like you know like he's basically saying hey I just don't want to call you ugly or I just don't want to call I just don't want to say that you know I think your nose is uh, atrocious and horrific and I just can't get past that it leaves the door open for her to speculate a whole bunch of things that are probably a whole lot worse than what he's actually feeling and it's okay for him to not be physically attracted to her and you know these experts are always saying that if you're not physically drawn to your partner in the beginning as you live with them and as the relationship grows you'll find things about them that are attractive and then you will become physically attracted to them that's what they've always said I, I, I've yet to see that happen to tell you the truth but that's what they always say so it would have been better for him just to say, you know what, I normally date, you know, dark haired women, or I'm normally drawn to women with, you know, uh, dark hair or brunettes or whatever. Um, or I'm normally drawn to ethnic women or whatever. And so then she could be like, okay, so it's not necessarily like, you know, like I'm not an attractive woman. I'm just not his type. And I think that's easier to, to digest than him saying, I'm protecting you. I don't want to tell you whether or not I'm attracted to you because I'm just trying to protect you. That just sounded a whole lot worse. So they both claim that they're willing to try. He says he wants to try to make it work. She says she wants to try to make it work, even though she was crying. So in her confessional, she did start crying because she said that she's normally a very confident woman, but this is testing her. And she didn't think that she would be in this type of situation. And so um, I also forgot to mention that 
in the beginning when her and uh, Brandon were talking after Pastor Cal left, the very first thing that she said to him before she asked him if he was attracted to her was when she said to him, I do believe that you're self-sabotaging because Pastor Cal brought that up. And she says, I agree with Pastor Cal that you are self-sabotaging. And he kind of like blew her off when she said that, but he is. And how is he self-sabotaging? He doesn't want to live in the same apartment with her. He doesn't want them to live together. That's a, a, a method of self-sabotaging the relationship because you're not going to get anywhere if you don't live together as a married couple. You're not going to get anywhere. So the fact that he doesn't even want to live with her right there shows that he's really not making a, a concerted effort to make this marriage work. Point blank, period. Moving on to Orion and Lauren. So Lauren tells us that, oh, they move in or no, they didn't move in. Let me backtrack. Um, they arrive at the apartment that they're supposed to be sharing, but Orion does not want to stay there. Okay, let's go from there. So Lauren tells us that um, on the plane ride back to Denver, Orion told her that he wanted a full reset. He wanted to put Cancun behind them and just start all over and start fresh. So this is kind of like, you know, let's whatever happens in Cancun stays in Cancun. We're going to arrive in Denver and we're going to just start all over. Wonderful. Orion also says that he wants space. So after they arrive at the apartment, he tells her that space will be good for them. He says he wants some space to clear his head because they're going to do this full reset. And for them to do this full reset, he needs his space first. Big red flag. So they both uh, decide to go back to their individual apartments. And then at some point, hopefully, you know, the plan is to move in together. So Lauren tells us that while they've been apart, Orion has sent her a text telling her that he did not want to continue in the marriage, but wanted to continue the process. So Orion, as now we see, he's great at this double talk. Um, he'll say one thing, but he's really meaning something else. Or he'll say two things, to, he'll say two things that just contradict each other. And you're like, you don't really know what the hell's going on. He says he wants to continue with the process, but he doesn't want to continue with the marriage. I don't, I don't know how you do that. <laughs> I don't know how this is married at first sight. This isn't roommates at first sight. Um, this isn't people who are trying to figure it out on first sight. This is married at first sight. So either you're going to stay married or you're going to not be on the show, but you're not going to not stay married and then continue the process. Like, what does that mean? So Dr. Pia pays him a visit. Lauren gives, um, Lauren questions his contradictions. Um, you say that you want a full reset, but then you say you don't want to be married. Like, what the hell is going on? Orion says that there's definitely chemistry between them. Well, I don't know why he says that. Obviously, Orion, you're not feeling any chemistry with her. Um, you're not feeling any chemistry with her because he says he doesn't have any. I don't know how you can not have romantic feelings, but claim that you still have chemistry. Like, what are you saying? Like, you just want to bang her, but you don't really want to develop a, a relationship with her. You don't really want to explore any emotions with her. You just want to, what, hit it and quit it? I don't, I don't get it. So Ryan says that there's chemistry between them, but the things, but things were said that had cut really deep. And of course, even though he said that he wanted a full reset, he's bringing in what happened and what was said in Cancun. So he brings up how communication with her is very difficult because when he tries to talk to her, she reacts and she goes from zero to 100. I have not seen this. I mean, she must be really um, showing out when the cameras are not there because whenever the cameras are there, I don't see her going from zero to 100. I mean, she's like the complete opposite of that. She's very patient with him. Um, she listens to him. She receives everything that he says. She's caring. I don't, I don't know what he means when he says, well, when I try to talk to you, I can't because you always go from zero to 100. I have yet to see that act like, to see her act like that. Dr. Pia, Dr. Pia tells them to start over and um, to let go of whatever the hell happened in Cancun. She's forgiven him. She says, I have forgiven him for whatever he said to me that hurt my feelings. I have forgiven it. I've let it go. He says he doesn't know if he can forgive her. He doesn't know if he can. So Dr. Pia asks Orion, why can't you be a little bit more flexible with her and try to forgive her or show her some grace? Why are you so rigid with this thing of, you know, holding her to the fire of the things that she said that you didn't like and you're like, 
because, you know, she says something jokingly or she says something flippant or she was sharing too much of her life. You're using all of that now against her. And so Lauren was like, you know what? Look, let's just cut to the chase. You know, let's just get through the BS. Let's get, get to the bottom line. And she tells this man, she says, do you just not want to be with me? It's okay. If you don't want to be with me, just tell me. It's perfectly okay. You're not, it's not going to kill me. If you don't want to be with me, just go ahead and tell me. So Orion says, with everything that's happened, I lost all romantic interest. So Dr. Pia, Dr. Pia says, Orion, how does control show up in your life? And he says, I'm not trying to control what happens by asking for a divorce. And Dr. Pia says, yes, you are. That's exactly what you're doing. You're using this whole thing of divorce to control the situation. So Dr. Pia asks if they're willing to work through their problems or do they just want to get a divorce? Orion says he wants to get a divorce. So then um, Lauren says, it doesn't really matter what I want because Dr. Pia asked her, so what do you want to do? And Lauren says, it doesn't matter what I want to do. And Dr. Pia says, yeah, it does matter what you want to do. So basically uh, Lauren believes that if they would have given it more time, things could have been different, but you know, whatever. So they're going to get a divorce. There's nothing left to say about it. Um, Orion, I think from the get go, wasn't feeling Lauren from the day that they got married. I don't think he was feeling her. And I think that... I kind of think he probably had set her up. <laughs> I'm beginning to think that maybe he set her up when he brought up the conversation about racial slurs and using derogatory derogatory terms about different cultures and different races. I think he was setting up a trap for her. And I think that he probably thought she was going to be offended when he said, well, I've used the N word in music or singing songs or whatever. I think he thought that that was going to offend her to the point where maybe she didn't want to be with him, but she was forgiving about that. And so then he turned around and he took what she said and he was going to use that as a catalyst to break up the relationship. And then, you know, she did the ultimate when she revealed to him that she had been with someone else a couple of months before being on the show or a couple of months before they got married, whatever the time frame was, and that he used as fuel to the fire. So I don't think he was feeling her at all from day one. I think that he was looking for something to end the relationship. And unfortunately, she unknowingly gave him the tools that he needed to end the marriage. And he never let go after that. So, but it's better for her that it's over. He wasn't feeling her and you don't want to stay with someone that's not feeling you. And um, as much as we may kind of like look at him kind of crazy, um, at least he was honest about his feelings. When he told her, I don't feel a romantic connection. I don't feel this. I don't feel that. Because you have people like, um, like um, Brennan, who's beating around the bush and not being honest, you know, with his wife. Um, but he should just tell her, you know, I just, I'm not attracted to you or you're not my type, but I'm working through it. But anyways, let's move on to Austin and Becca. So they get to their new apartment and they talk about their living standards and what to expect from one another. And, um, they go to Austin's apartment and while they're there, Austin says, this is what I thought was kind of telling a little bit. Austin says to Becca that if they do decide to be together on decision day, he still is expecting that they go back to their separate homes and live out their leases and then come and live together. And I was like, that's odd because this isn't the first couple that would have had existing leases um, that have been on the show and, you know, they'll still find a way to try to live together. So she says, well, I have a month to month. So I don't have a lease to break really. So it would make more sense for you to come live with me. And then he said, but I have a roommate. Okay. So what? Like, I don't, what, what are you trying to say, Austin? You, when you signed up for this show, I'm pretty sure you had a discussion with your roommate that, Hey, if things really work out for me, when I sign up for married at first sight and me and whoever they partner me with, we end up wanting to be together. What are we going to do about this one year lease or two year lease? You know, how are we going to navigate through this? I'm pretty sure you had a discussion with your roommate about that, that if it did work out, because I'm thinking you were hoping that it would work out. So you have to make plans about, okay, what are you going to do? Because you're not going to not live with your wife if y'all choose to be together. But that was the first thing that popped into his mind was, Hey, even if we choose to stay together, let's go back to our individual homes and live out our leases. But what if, you know, she has a one year lease, like you're not going to be living with your wife for a whole year. But Becca was like, no, you're going to come live with me. And that's just how it's going to be. 
<laughs> and so he's like, okay, yeah. Okay, so when he agreed to that so readily like that, um, I'm beginning to see like this is like a pattern. I'm, I'm probably putting too much into this. I'm probably overanalyzing Austin. But I feel like he says things just to get along with Becca. But y'all, I really don't think, I'm not gonna say that he doesn't like her. He does like her. I think he does like her and I think he does care for her. But I don't think that his attraction for her is as strong as her attraction for him. And I think that for the most part, he wants to make peace with her and he just says and does things just to get along because he doesn't want to be confrontational. And the reason why I say he doesn't want to be confrontational is because, um, um, when they were in Cancun and uh, they were, uh, he was telling her how the guys were asking him how things were going with him and Becca and he kind of downplayed how great things were going with them because he doesn't want to, you know, be, he doesn't want to appear boisterous or like he's bragging or that his relationship is so much better than everybody else's. So he's got this thing about um, either a lot of attention being on him or being confrontational. I don't know, but there's something going on with Austin y'all that I just don't think that him and Becca are exactly on the same level when it comes to attraction and likeness. But when they had their visit from Pastor Cal, Pastor Cal said that they looked really married and comfortable with one another. And, you know, he was touching her. She was touching him. Um, they're very touchy-feely with one another. There was a moment during the meeting when she was crying when they're talking about religion and he was scooting even closer to her and holding her and comforting her. So I know that he cares a lot about her. I just don't know if there's that strong chemistry on his end. And the reason why I say that is because when Pastor Cal asked, have y'all consummated the marriage? And um, Austin said, no, um, not in so many words, whatever that means. <laughs> so something's been going on, but not, you know. So he says, no, we haven't consummated the marriage. But um, he says that they're taking it slow and he really wants to connect and bond on other things. I feel like that if he was ready to go, Becca is definitely not going to stop him. I think Becca has given him the green light on that, but he wants to slow it down. And y'all know what my theory is. If a man on this show wants to slow it down and, you know, doesn't want to consummate right away, even though the woman does, it makes me feel like he's not really that attracted to her. His attraction to her is not that strong. And so that's what I'm thinking. But um, I don't know. I don't know. I could be wrong. It might be a whole different story next week. Moving on to Cameron and Claire. Not much to say with Cameron and Claire as far as I'm concerned. Um, I love, I don't know why, but I really like Cameron and I really hope that it works out with Claire. I don't want Claire to break his heart, but anyways, so um, they get to their new apartment and they talk about, you know, living together and what that's going to be like. And he says that he has lived with a partner before. So he's used to it. He's not as nervous as she is about moving in together. She's never lived with a partner. So they talk about that. And what else is, was interesting about Cameron and Claire? Oh, so they, I think it was, uh, they have a conversation about religion and he finds out that she's Catholic and he is not religious at all. So she says something about, you know, I respect that. I'm okay with that, but I was raised Catholic. Um, she kind of strayed from the Catholic religion, I think, but then when her brother passed away, her, um, faith was restrengthened. And so she says to him, well, we're going to have a conversation about that. And I'm like, why, why are we having a conversation about that? He doesn't mind that you're Catholic. You don't mind that he's not that religious. So what are we having a conversation for? So then Dr. Pepper comes to pay them a visit. Cameron says that they struggle with, um, like a physical intimacy, like just being touchy feely, lovey dovey on one another. They, they kind of struggle with that. And, um, Clara says that she is not very touchy feely. She's never been like that in her relationships, but because that's something that he wants, she says that she is going to work on that. And in fact, she started holding his hand during the meeting with Dr. Pepper. Um, Clara agrees. Okay. Uh, they talk about religion and, you know, Dr. Pepper, says that you don't have to share the same religious beliefs or spirituality, but she, it is good to have the same core values and which basically they do, you know, they believe in being nice and kind and whatever, whatever. So the religion part is not a big deal. I don't think it's a big deal. I, I don't know. Maybe it's going to be different later, but I don't think it's a big deal. Claire and Cameron are the couple that they're doing all the right things, but it still may not work out. It's like they're following what they're supposed to follow, they're talking, they're communicating, they're open with one another, but it still might not work out. I feel like with um, Austin and Becca, I feel like Austin is holding back on something. 
there's something about that makes me think that he's kind of like holding back. I'm not sure exactly why or what, but I feel like he's not completely tr being really open with Becca. And then Brendan and Emily, you know, like I said, Brendan, you know, wanted to take it slow, which means that he's not attracted to her. And that was confirmed in this episode that he's not attracted to her. And I think with the history of this show, from what I can remember, and I could be wrong, if the guy doesn't feel a physical attraction for the woman, even if the woman doesn't feel it for him, but if the guy definitely doesn't feel the physical attraction for the woman, but the woman does for him, the relationship isn't going to go anywhere. It is not going to go anywhere because it's going to be a big problem. It's going to be the thing that they talk about all the time because a lot of women don't want to live with a man who doesn't find them attractive. And so this is going to come up time and time and time again to the point where the man is going to get frustrated and either end up moving out or in this case, Brennan may never even move in. And, um, she's just always, she's going to be questioning herself. It's going to mess with her, her, her self-confidence and she's going to be crying all the time. And it's just going to be like a really blow to her ego that she is living with a man or she's been paired with a man that doesn't find her physically attractive because, like we've learned in the page and Chris season that even if a man ain't attracted to you, um, a lot of them will still, you know, mm -hmm, with you because Chris and Paige, Chris says he wasn't attracted to her. Like she was too damn dark for him, blah, blah, blah. He said of all, all the women in Atlanta that y'all could have found for me, y'all choose this one. But he still consummated that damn marriage, even though he never moved in with her. Thank you so much for joining me. I really do appreciate it on your way out. Please don't forget to rate the video. If you like this content, please subscribe to my channel. And I'll definitely talk to you later. Bye.